Welcome to the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp. This is session two of six. Today is Thursday, January 19th, and our topic today is milk at the market. So welcome to the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp. My name is Rachel Painter, and I'm a value-added agriculture marketing extension specialist with the Center for Profitable Agriculture. By participating in these sessions, you have the opportunity to receive a special requirement educational credit with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture's Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program. So to receive that special requirement credit, you will need to view five of the six sessions and complete the evaluation survey for each of those sessions, so meaning five times, um, before April 1st. So in the emails that go to the registrants, you will receive that link. You will also receive the recordings. So if you are not joining us live, that is perfectly okay. Just watch the sessions on your own time and then complete the survey. If you have any questions about the TAEP program, you can contact TDA at producer.diversification at tn.gov. Again, I'm a specialist with the Center for Profitable Agriculture, and we offer farmers help in evaluation, planning, and development of value-added enterprises. You can find more information about other programs that we offer at cpa.tennessee.edu, and I would really encourage you to follow us on Facebook as well. To offer these farmers market vendor trainings, obviously we have many people that we collaborate with all the time to offer educational programs through Extension, and we always rely heavily on our Extension agents. So you have an Extension agent in all 95 counties and here in the state of Tennessee, and I would encourage you to find your local agent if you are not familiar with them. Again, you can find your local agent by going to utextension.tennessee.edu and find your agent, talk to them, answer. Uh, they, they can help you answer questions um, about any topic related to agriculture. There's also family and consumer sciences agents and 4-H youth development agents in every office. We also work uh, very closely with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. Some of our presenters today are, all of them today are with TDA. And I would encourage you to find their Pick Tennessee Products platform. This is a free marketing platform that is available for our farmers uh, selling direct across the state. If you have any questions about that, again, uh, go to picktnproducts.org. Um, you can apply to be listed on that platform there and find more contact information if you have questions. We also work closely with the Tennessee Association of Farmers Markets. In one of our future sessions, we'll host um, their president as one of our speakers. But if you have questions about joining that association, you can go to tnfarmersmarkets.org. They also have resources for you as a vendor or as a market manager. Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Paul. He is with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture as a state ratings officer. And today our topic again is milk at the market. All right, well again, uh, Rachel, I uh, just wanna say thank you and give our gratitude from the department for allowing us to participate in this boot camp and be a part of y'all series. And hopefully we can help uh, teach you a few things and answer some some questions, maybe some misnomers, um, certainly with with the uh, farmers markets. And today I'll try to keep it focused in on just dairy and milk in the market. And um, I guess before I get started, let me just give a little background to everybody. Um, so yes, I am a state ratings officer. I started with the Department of Agriculture um, just a little over seven years ago as a food and dairy inspector. And so at that point, I would uh, do in some inspections and visits at least at the farmers markets um, in the Middle Tennessee area. Um, and then I did that for a few years, got promoted to a uh, manufacturing foods for and dairy inspector. So I was still checking out dairy farms, uh, retail stores, but more focused on the manufacturing side. And then nearly four years ago, I've got promoted to this position as a, it says SRO. So we're called state rating officer. The, the feds call us a sanitation rating officer or a milk rating officer. So anyways, just to give a little background, and I'd also like to say thank you again to Patricia uh, Zapanos Hart for joining us today and helping out. So as we get to the end of this presentation and we get a lot of questions, and I'm sure you guys will, will have some after this, um, she'll be able to help me answer that. And also having uh, Kathy Rubin on here on our produce side, appreciate you guys. 
So anyways, just a little background and uh and as my role as a rating officer and kind of what we what we deal with and hopefully I can answer some some of the, the things and discrepancies that we've dealt with. So uh, we'll focus on some of these regulations and requirements, um, certainly the typical things that we deal with in the marketplace, uh, the best practices that we find um, and look at any discrepancies and ultimately help you all you know, be safe and successful and uh, with your products at, at the market. So anyways, if, if you would, we'll go to the, uh, go to the next slide. So uh, the first item of discussion is uh, raw milk. Um, you know, can it be sold there? Can, can we sell raw milk at the farmer's market? If you go to the next slide. Well, here, as you see in the state of Tennessee, currently it is still illegal for any person to produce, to manufacture, process, you package, transport, to sell, offer for sale, to trade or barter uh, that raw milk or raw milk products in the state of Tennessee. So <clears throat> that may change in time, but for now it is the, that is the current law. And we're going to delve into some of our exceptions. As you see right here, we have a we have a few listed. I'm going to try to to expound on those a little bit more. So if you'll you'll start the next slide. So first up, let's talk about uh, the personal consumption or uh, the personal use exception in the in in, in raw milk. So <clears throat> an independent or a partial owner of a hoof mammal. And when we're, we're talking hoof mammal, obviously, um, I, I would assume everybody's familiar, but that's talking about a mammal of lacteal secretion and in Tennessee recognized and the federal federal milk ordinance is recognized as a cattle, goat, any sheep, uh, camel or water buffalo. So a hoof mammal that may use milk from that mammal for the owner's personal consumption or other personal use only. That's it. That is that is in statute. So. What else does that mean? This allows for the consumption or use of that raw milk if all of the following requirements are met. And so as you see listed, you have to meet every single one of these. So one has to be a hoof mammal. The ownership of that animal um, that's producing the milk has to be an ind independent owner, or you can have partial ownership as this third point goes into this third sub point talking about herd share programs. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about those um, here in just a, a few slides or maybe a couple slides, but we'll talk more about the herd share. And again, let's, let's just keep it reined in. Herd share can go to a lot of different areas, but we're gonna keep it just focused on the milk side. So, and then lastly, again, the personal consumption or other personal use is the, is the last requirement that it must, that it must meet. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so again, what does that mean? So personal consumption and use does not require a license. The milk does not have to be tested or inspected or regulated. And I will get more into this, uh, this regulation and inspection process in, in one of our other subtopics uh, here, here shortly. But certainly a difference that we see is that this milk product would, uh, would not currently fall under a jurisdiction. So requiring such uh, things as antibiotic testing or coliform or other pathogen tests, um, nobody, nobody oversees the operations. So <clears throat> Tennessee law is, um, is specific about purchasing raw milk out of state and bringing it back and selling it to another person, a party or a business out of state. So all these, all these items is, is what this is going into. You don't have to have a license. That milk is not tested, inspected, or regulated. It is limited to just the personal use. Again, you cannot sell. You cannot offer to sell or barter or trade this product. It has to be for interstate commerce only. You can take your own supply of raw milk with you or for your own consumption, say when going on vacation in another state. That is allowed, but that's that would be it. Just for personal use, it cannot be sold. And you cannot purchase out of state and bring it back into the state. So if you will, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so we'll kind of get into a little bit of the nitty gritty here on herd sharing. So hopefully this topic leads us to, again, dispel any misnomers. Um, 
and and any confusion. And so hopefully we can we can help with that. But herd sharing is is commonplace in dealing with with raw milk. So generally this occurs when someone buys the food item and that is produced by the share owned animal and in this case milk. So the ownership of that animal typically occurs at the time of the product purchase. So be mindful though, herd ownership means that it is for the unfinished product of the animal. So otherwise you get into a situation such as, you know, maybe even custom processing of an animal and that requires a whole other set of regulations and permitting outside of this scope. So per state law for the processing of unfinished product for other personal use may only be done by the owner of that unfinished uh, product. So for example, you can't get raw milk as a buyer and have that seller then go and make you say cheese with it. Again, um, that you know opens us right back up into a, a different sticky situation like that custom processing um, even for manufacturing retail sale and, <clears throat> and that requirement voids the herd share exception. So, so what does that mean? Let's, uh, let's see if we can pull that next slide. So in other words, the sale of finished dairy products from one, over, one owner to the another is not covered by herd share. So that's strictly food manufacturing and retail sale, as I just said, and both of which would require a license. So purchases, uh, or excuse me, purchasers of the unfinished products, you may fin it yourselves um, and into other products, but it has to be again for your own personal use or consumption. So um, I think, yeah, I'll say, um, you can keep it right there, but I think that for, for today's session, um, that's gonna be as far as we go discussing the herd sharing, but you know, feel free to reach out to our department if you would like more guidance on this area. Um, you know, we all have staff contact information at the very end of the presentation. Um, and we would love to you know, make sure that we are available to answer those kind of questions and dispel things that, uh, you know, that it gets muddled up sometimes. And certainly we try to be very consistent and uh, amongst our inspectors out in the field and, and with our office staff. Um, but yes, again, if you have questions, I'll have some, some, some names or emails up there for if you'd reach out to us if, if, um, if, if we don't help you today, okay? All right, so moving right along, um, we'll transition over to uh, another item of exception, and um, we'll talk a little about the raw milk butter allowance. So as you see, this, uh, this, there was a Senate bill number 358. It was signed into law in 2019 to allow um, this exception. So this allows for the retail sale of raw or or what we call unpasteurized butter, if and only if it meets the following criteria. And so as you see, it has to be produced separately from pasteurized product in a separate facility. So to those unfamiliar, I will, um, I'll touch more on the pasteurization in just a, just a few minutes or so. Uh, secondly, it is solely um, for interstate commerce. So it's not to be sold outside of the state in Tennessee. And then it must be produced by someone licensed by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and they are permitted as a dairy manufacturer or dairy plant. And lastly, they have to meet the labeling requirements. So that label must include exactly the following statement. So that warning, the product has not been inspected by the Department of Agriculture. It is a raw butter that may contain disease causing microorganisms. Persons at highest risk of the disease from these organisms include newborns and infants, the elderly and pregnant women, those taking corticosteroids, antibiotics or antacids, and those having chronic illnesses or other conditions that weaken their immunity. So that is in the law against that, that's three, 358 Senate bill that states you have to meet this criteria and on that warning statement, it has to have um, word for word. So. Okay, let's see. We'll go ahead and we'll move to the next slide. All right. So again, what does this mean? <clears throat> so it has to be done in a separate facility. So that raw milk butter is produced separately. So get, given full protection, um, and there's a lot of cross contamination risk, and uh, and it's strictly we're trying to mitigate that. So yes, separate facility for production. 
and it also has to be done by somebody that carries a dairy processing license with a tied in understanding that this product is not tested or inspected or, or regulated. So <clears throat> additionally, the interstate commerce applies for selling product and it remains subject to the Tennessee FD&C Act as cited in the 53-1-101 code. And under this regulation, it requires that the product cannot be adulterated. A regulatory agency uh, shall tag, uh, de uh, detain, or destroy any adulterated product. And moreover, under this act, the seller or producer may be civilly or criminally liable of any adulterated fruit product. So again, these, these are protective measures in place um, on both sides here, but certainly for the consumer. So if you will go to the next slide, that'll, that'll be the end of that exception. We're gonna move to the third uh, exception discussion and that's talking about pet food. And so in this, in this exception, raw milk that is labeled and sold as pet food means that any commercial feed prepared and distributed for consumption by pets. So this also means that they must have a commercial feed license. Uh, these uh, products will require uh, guidance and regulatory oversight by the Department of Agriculture. So more specifically, the commercial feed operations um, will be permitted by the Agricultural Input Section of Consumer and Industry Services Division here at, here at Department of Ag. And so, and those who will do the inspecting and the testing of, of that product. And I'll have, <clears throat> I'll have some information um, that you can reach out to the Ag Inputs team on, on a different slide. And I think, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. So in complying, the pet food must adhere to Tennessee commercial feed law and state regulations. So they must be labeled as pet food with required levels of protein, fat, fiber, and moisture that's stated on the that's stated on that label. Number two, they must have the species of that animal. So, be it you know raw, you know goat milk, um, or raw uh, cow milk, for just for example. And then lastly, they must have that precautionary statement um, that says not for not for human food consumption. And so let's see, what else did I wanna say about that? So it's also subject to administrative enforcement actions, penalties, licensing fees, potential criminal charges. And, and just keep in mind um, when going for this uh, permit, th those fees will be uh, based on volume. So, and that, that last statement, if, if necessary, criminal charges could, could potentially arise in these cases, if not uh, not complying with that commercial feed law and meeting the requirements of state regulations. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> in a to wrap it up in an, in the uh, obtaining raw milk, um, the ways you can obtain such legally in the state of Tennessee is number one, uh, via the, an owner of a hoofed mammal. Uh, that produces milk. Number two, you can utilize uh, it as raw milk butter. Or number three, you can use it as pet food. And again, you have to meet the previous requirements that were just discussed. And, and again, this I, this is recorded so you can all get a copy of all these that, that may help you down the road as well. But there's your contact information at the very bottom of the screen. Um, so if you would like to reach out to our Ag Inputs team about that uh, pet food licensing, um, feel free to do so. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this, this gives me a neat opportunity and I appreciate this to kind of talk about pasteurization and, you know, what it means, just some basic science behind it and when, when it's required and, and certainly, you know, dispel any, any ignorance on it or just questions on, uh, on the guidance issues for it. So, you know, pasteurization, it means the heating of every particle of milk or milk, milk product uh, for a specific period of time and for temperature in order to destroy the pathogenic microorganisms. So most known pathogens associated with raw milk are 
E. coli and the sugar toxin producing E. coli, the O17, O157, H7. I always get that mixed up. Campylobacter, Listeria monocytogenes, um, Cryptosporidium, and Brucella, as well as Salmonella. So those are those are typically found in in raw milk and in the um, microorganism issues that, that we find, especially foodborne in the public. So this heat treatment that we're talking about, pasteurization of the milk and milk particles is required to be done in approved and properly operated equipment. And so we look even for design, uh, we call it 3A sanitary standard design or equivalent. So in my job, <clears throat> especially in consultations or working with businesses, um, and they're looking for equipment, looking to do pasteurization. And you know, we talk about if we can't uh, see this this item from a dealer or a, a seller, we wanna look for literature before we can inspect it so we can see that it meets this 3A or equivalent um, requirement. And so that's when we will deem as a department if it's acceptable equipment. So there's different types of pasteurizers that you can use, you know, um, whether it's a batch or what, what a lot of people call a vat pasteurizer versus a, a high temperature, a short time pasteurizer. And that will change the, um, certainly the time and temperature at which pasteurization will be required on your, your milk product. So if you're using a vat pasteurizer, you must for a minimum pasteurize at 145 degrees in at least 30 minutes. And if you're using a high temperature short time, it changes to you must pasteurize for at least 161 degrees Fahrenheit at at least 15 seconds. And what Tennessee does is 18 seconds because we do not recognize volumetric testing um, as a method um, for those high temperature short time units. But when we start talking about frozen desserts and pasteurization, so you start in increasing your sugar and fat levels, that would also change the minimum requirement. So if you're vat pasteurizing, say ice cream mix, um, it, you have to pasteurize at least 155 degrees for at least 30 minutes. And if you're using the HTST, you would pasteurize for at least 175 degrees and at least 25 seconds. So I don't, want, I don't mean to get us too much in the weeds, but I did want to kind of just branch into that and allow people to see from, from our perspective as certainly as dairy regulators and keeping product wholesome and safe, um, you know, our, our goal in, in being able to explain some of those regs that we look at as a product gets out into being processed and going into commerce. So the, as you see the pasteurized milk ordinance that I put on there, just to give a brief excerpt is, you know, it's the PMO, that's our background. All right, that's our dairy Bible as we call it. So um, it's the set of minimum standards and requirements established by the Food and Drug Administration that regulates uh, the production, processing, uh, and even packaging of the grade A milk and milk products. Um, the latest revision that Tennessee has adopted and that is out there right now is the 2019 uh, pasteurized milk ordinance. And it hasn't changed since because COVID hit and we haven't had any uh, NCIMS um, meetings to discuss between industry and regulatory, any changes. So no revision since, and we'll have a meeting coming up in, in April to discuss with the committees and look at proposals submitted. And, and again, we'll pass out information to the public and certainly to our uh, industry partners and, and vendors, yeah, any changes certainly in the revision that we adopt. So non-grade A products um, addressed, you know, so we, this PMO refers to grade A products, the non-grade A products, and certainly, you know, we're going to talk a little about cheese and, and, and kefir and, and uh, frozen desserts. Those will be referenced in the PMO, but under the, the code of federal regulation. So we, you're going to hear us out in the field talk about CFRs and, and good manufacturing practices. And again, I'm, I'm happy, uh, I'm thrilled that Patricia's on here. Because she is, she is one of our resident gurus for CGMPs and CFRs, and she is certainly a, a subject matter expert that um, will be able to help you guys answer some of these questions you may have um, and misnomers that we have that arise from our grade A and non, or non grade A foods. So, again, pasteurization is vital for certain foods to be manufactured and, and certainly sold uh, for retail. 
So, all right. So when is pasteurization required? That's a great question. And what I'm showing you here is a picture that's at the MTSU Creamery for some, you know, some of you may have seen this before um, a couple times a year, I'll teach a, I'll teach a class for industry and even state partners on equipment testing and going over processing and, and, and gives people a good hands-on experience for, you know, the, the raw to the finished uh, milk uh, process. So this is, again, this is a picture of a high temperature short time unit. It's really, it's really, really small. So it's a whole lot different than say when I go to a General Mills plant or, um, you know, or the Kroger milk plant or, or Mayfield and, and you've got these much, much larger units. But this, this just kind of gives people a good hands-on experience and not get overwhelmed and to ex understand the flow uh, as we do our equipment testing and, and what that means. You can go to the next slide. So um, before I before I break into those, you know, when I talk about when is pasteurization required, it, you know, again, it depends on the product and what you're trying to accomplish and and how you need to process it. So it's an <clears throat> it's important to recognize the best practices for uh, processing, handling and, and and even the storage of, of these foods. So as you see here, this is these are the common products that I'm focusing on today because again, it's you know, milk, milk product in the marketplace, uh, you know, grade A, non-grade A. So cheese is not considered a grade A product. Kefir, um, yogurt is, is considered a grade A, and then we have frozen desserts. But, but cheese does not require pasteurization necessarily if you intend to sell it as a hard cheese, and it must be aged for 60 days or longer. You know, typical things we see, you know, Parmesan's a, a hard cheddar or Asiago or Manchego would be a good example for that, hard cheese and aging. Um, but what is typical and what I see at a lot of our our dairy farms are using the, the soft and semi-soft, such as Chev or Feta, Gouda, Jacks or Mozzarella, and then some cheddars, um, and they will need to be pasteurized. Again, I mentioned the, the time and temperature uh, requirements for those. Um, and kefir, kefir in the same right, and and we can talk about cheesecloths if you if you all want to as well. But you still have to make sure, um, you know, on upon initial, uh, that we are pasteurizing that milk beforehand, unless it meets that hard cheese and aging requirement. Uh, the yogurt, which does meet the standard of identity to be recognized as a grade A product, uh, requires pasteurization prior to uh, production. In addition, the pasteurizing milk denatures its protein, so it obviously it allows its coagulation um, as that milk cultures, and it's done prior to the addition of, of the starter cultures, which ensures that uh, it remains active for fermentation. So, and lastly, frozen desserts, uh, depending if you are a scoop shop and you make ice cream direct to consumers or or manufacturing determines your, your pasteurization uh, requirement. So if you have, for example, if you have a grade A product and you introduce it with another uh, grade A product after initial pasteurization, it is required that you repasteurize. And, and keep in mind also that after formulation of your frozen desserts, um, the entire mix, except for flavoring ingredients and I believe it, it specifically states fruits nuts or flavoring it shall be pasteurized but in this we're, we're talking manufacturing level if you're doing a an ice cream parlor where you're making your you got your homemade recipe and you you've got your you're freezing your hardening cabinets and you you want to sell it soft serve or you want to do a, say you, you're doing your own gelato it, that that changes things and again Patricia will help me um, if she needs to explain that a little differently, uh, we can do that. But with that being said, just be mindful again, as you have any TCS products in the market, that's for, for retail sale, it has to be kept based on the item, either frozen or held under the proper refrigeration temperature of 41, uh, 41 degrees or below. So I think that'll about wrap up these milk items. Um, and so here's some of our contacts just in the dairy section. Um, I don't know if any of them were able to make it on today's uh, a panel, um, but re f please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. Um, certainly if you'd like to get into uh, processing or, or anything that you've done or, or 
certainly there's there's been some interpretation uh, I don't want to say changes but but uh, interpretations of the law Tennessee what I've said today this is what with our legal our legal team and our consumer and industry services team this is what our interpretations of the law are based on what is written in Tennessee uh, codes uh, the fed and as well as the federal uh, codes all right um, thank you, Paul and Rachel, for giving me this time to give a brief overview of the produce safety program. I know this is off topic, but so let's please think of this as a short commercial break from milk. And Paul, and this also gives Paul and Patricia a chance to look at the questions that you have put in the chat box. So to proceed, hi, I'm Kathy Rubin, and I am the produce coordinator for the state of Tennessee. Um, before I proceed, I wanted to take this time to say thank you to all you all for providing fresh produce to the public. I know how much work is involved in making this happen and we, the public, truly appreciate this. Nothing makes me happier than seeing a vibrant market with lots to offer. Next slide, please. For a brief overview, the Produce Safety Program went into effect in 2016 to focus on preventive measures in keeping produce, particularly fruits and vegetables, safe. This is part of the Food Modernization Safety Act, and we are doing this through inspections and education. I know that inspections do not give people a warm, fuzzy feeling because who wants to be audited all the time, right? But it is one of the safeguards in protecting the public. TDA, along with the farmers, that is you, share this responsibility. We each have to do our part in making sure that the public, like this girl, eats safe produce. Next slide, please. Currently, um, there are no licensing or permits required to grow fruits and vegetables in Tennessee. Um, and these, this is a lot of the questions we get when farmers reach out to us and say, what licenses or permits do we need to grow and sell produce? And the answer is, there is no permits required at this time. However, we do perform produce safety inspections if the farm is covered by the produce safety rule. And just to be honest, majority of your farms won't be subjected to inspections. There are three factors that we look into before a farm is considered for inspections. The first is the type of produce that you grow or harvest. These will be the fruits and vegetables that are generally eaten raw, such as berries, tomatoes, leafy greens, mushrooms. So if your farm just deals with pumpkins, potatoes, or corns, or things that necessarily have, that are eaten not raw, or you have to cook it, these are not covered by the rules. The next thing that we look into is the size of the farms. So most farms that sell produce between, below 28,000 a year, they are not subject to inspections. Another factor is the type of activities that are performed in the farm. So this includes growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of the produce activities. Anything outside of that, or especially when it leaves the farm, or if you um, make pickles or jams, those fall under a different section. Patricia, who is also on this call, does handles the manufacturing. So if you have questions about pickles and making jams and TCS Foods, she's our go-to person. So if you have any questions on whether your farm falls under this rule, please feel, please reach out to me after this call. We will be providing my contact information as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so the most relevant part of our program for you is the education opportunities we provide. We offer free, and I say free, educational farm visits, which we call which we call on farm readiness reviews. This is where we visit farms upon request to evaluate and give suggestions on how you can improve your produce safety practices. We would usually come with someone from the University of Tennessee so that you can get input from both an educated educator and a regulate, regulator. We also can invite the UT Extension Office representative and your farms. Uh, farmer's market manager, if that is something that you're open to. It's all about you guys and what you feel comfortable with. 
Um, we also hold Produce Safety Alliance grower trainings around the year. Here you will learn about the produce safety practices and produce safety rule requirements. I would highly recommend this training regardless of size or status of your farm. Our virtual, virtual classes are normally two half days and cost $25. We will be having an in-person one during the Pick Tennessee conference on February 18, which I hope um, from what I've been hearing, I've seen the agenda for the Pick Tennessee conference. It has a lot of relevant, interesting topics. Registration is now available as well. Um, Another opportunity are the different workshops that we hold throughout the year that deals with various produce safety topics such as pre and post harvest water, sanitation, and worker hygiene. Um, I will coordinate with Rachel and your farmer's market manager to get to let you know when these events are happening. Um, and then again, please feel free to reach out if you have specific questions about requirements under the PSR rule. We have been receiving a lot of inquiries about microgreens and mushrooms recently because from what I understand that, it, well, not understand, from what I know, it is the trend. There's high demand for these products. Next slide, please. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to reintroduce the produce safety program to you guys. And I would love to have a chance to connect with you individually. Rachel will also be sharing my contact information after this session. So thank you again. So again, now we will um, start answering some questions. So Paul and Patricia, did you have any um, questions you want to begin with? Yeah, let me, uh, if you don't mind, Trish, let me take a, a couple of these that I saw real quick. Um, so is there anything, is there any currently anything that works allow for raw milk sales without a herd share? So right now in the state of Tennessee, there is not. And we're seeing other other states change their laws and I, I know there's something proposed. So there's been something proposed, but nothing accepted as of right now in legislature. So it, as of now, it is still, it's still illegal uh, to do anything other than you're falling under those exceptions or the herd share. Um, let me make sure, would it be wise to have a Senate Bill 358 warning included? So it really, it was just for the purpose of the, um, of this this boot camp just to just to make sure I put some law behind it for everyone to see it's certainly I'm not going to say it's recommended or even suggested if you'd like to you can um, but I, ag does not uh, and, and Trish may have a different response but we try not to get too involved in this in, in the herd share agreements and how it's how it's uh, things are stated um, we just say hey you know, this is what Tennessee where federal law requires and this is what you're allowed um, and the rest is up to you when it comes to you know being your own manager um, or owner and having people sign up under you that's that's up to you really if you'd like to you're welcome to and you know the more you can back yourself up from a legal standpoint and and helping yourself with against liability uh, issues um, go for it so I hope I hope that answers that question let me know if it if it does and if you'd like me you'd like us to to talk more about it, but that's what I would say. All right, can I jump in here for a minute, Paul? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I did want to kind of just finish up on on uh, the question you were talking about. When it comes to drafting agreements, just like any other legal document, um, we'll always suggest that you consult with legal counsel. Um, they will be the best people out there to to make sure that what you're putting out there with your name on it is going to protect you in the best capacity. Um, you can also reach out to the Center for Profitable Agriculture with additional questions because I believe they have some legal type resources and they actually are giving a presentation at Pick Tennessee that just talks about liability insurance and, and different things you can do to protect yourself. So I just wanted to throw that one out there. Um, the next two questions talk about the term adulterated. So great questions. So adulterated speaks to something that may be wrong with it. So if a food is adulterated, it may bear or contain poisonous or deleterious substances that may render it to injure somebody's health. 
it can consist in whole or part of any filthy, putrid, decomposed substance that would make it unfit for food, or it, if it's prepared, packed, or held under insanitary conditions. So that's all like gross things that nobody wants to hear about, but, but that is the difference. So adding ingredients to your product, as long as the, they are a safe and wholesome ingredient and you're preparing your product in a safe, safe and wholesome environment, that would not bring it under the adulterated category. All right, I'll let you jump back in, Paul. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> As vendors who will be bringing their product to meet herd share participants at the market, can you explain the storage and transport cooling temperatures to be in compliance or for safety? So it's a great food question in general. Um, you know, certainly we, we harp on uh, safe storage and transportation a lot on the dairy side, but just as much with any food product, milk, milk uh, or milk product as well as um yeah so it you know when you're you know typically we see a lot of things brought in through coolers um and and for, you know storage units that are hooked up to inverters and we look for thermometers to be in place and they're working so when that, that slide that mentioned the 41 degrees or below or if you're bringing a uh, frozen product and you're kept you know typically you're going to be in locked those locked units or even on a trailer that's brought in to the marketplace, um, you know, those are fine. You know, is they are in a pr protective manner where um, there's no issue with, with that storage unit you're using. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, and as far as the, the temperatures, again, um, it, that should suffice as far as freezing or that 41 or below for, for cold health products that just need to be refrigerated and controlled. Okay, so let's see the next question. So UHT, why is it not common? So that's a good question. I would love to have somebody from the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition or even the Food and Drug Administration uh, talk about that. It's not a, uh, it's, I, I don't really know why it's not common. I think it's just, um, I think just the practice of high temperature and, and uh, high heat so HTST and HH um, timing and and pasteurization, I think, is just the most common for our processing facilities. I I, I can't speak to any certainly political or or lobbying reasons, but uh, but just in in our discussions with um, our FDA milk specialists, these are just the items that um, are the methods, if you will that are typically used. I, I can't say why UHT is not, um, is not more, you know, more of a, a prevalent uh, method. So let's see, Trish, anything you want to, oh, there's, there was a question I saw earlier and let me address this real quick so I don't lose my train of thought. And this was a question that I saw about the alpaca and the llama milk. So I believe it's page, oh boy. I get it wrong, I get it wrong, but I believe it's page six of the pasteurized milk ordinance. It does allow for alpaca and llama milk. So I, I know I spoke on the five, it's the common, those are the common uh, mammals in the state of Tennessee, but um, the, the, the Food and Drug Administration does recognize those animals as uh, allowable um, for as long as they're lacteal secreted animals. And those two were listed on, on the uh, the ordinance for uh, the mammals that are allowed. So yes, I hope that answers your question with a good thumbs up. And so now as far as studying processing and I would reach out to a different uh, firm that does analysis. Uh, certainly certainly we don't do that here, um, but maybe, maybe I could look into that for you and you just shoot me an email and uh, just give me your contact and maybe I can get you some more information on that if that sounds good. Excellent. Um, some pie, some pie talk. So we've got a question that are pies that contain milk, do they fall under the requirements? Great question. So milk when used as an ingredient in things like pies or cookies or fudge, I'm going to start by saying it depends. 
in July, July 1st of last year, the Tennessee Food Freedom Act passed. And the Tennessee Food Freedom Act changed the scope of what home producers could make and sell to the public without a license. So answer one is if you are making baked goods like a pie that do not require temperature control for safety, so they don't have to be refrigerated, you can make those at home under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act as long as you follow all of the other Tennessee Food Freedom Act rules. But if the pie does have to be refrigerated, then no, that is not something that could be made um, without a license. So I would say a pecan pie is something you could make at home under Tennessee Food Freedom Act, but a banana cream pie would not fall under those regulations. All right, Paul, I think you're up next. Yeah, this, <clears throat> this is a question I actually got recently out in the field, and thankfully I was working with the branch director for uh, Milk Cooperative of FDA. So hopefully I can uh, quickly answer this. So um, I believe that's a UVC, um, should be talking about uh, the ultra uh, ultraviolet, um, these and, and, the, and the light and the nanometers to, with enough concentration that it would be a viable option. So <clears throat> as of right now, it uh, it does not work for milk and milk products. So for water, you know, if we're talking use of water, it absolutely does. But based on the viscosity, the density of milk in that product, it does not, um, it is not an option for pathogen destruction. And so that's why pasteurization uh, has been the, the go-to and that is the, that is the be all. So then that is talking not just state, but that is a federal law. So the UVC would not be a viable option. And so uh, I'm not going to tell people not to use that in their system. I'm just, it's not going to, it's not going to take care of the issue and it's not going to be a, a good safeguard measure just because of, of that product. But it's a, Hey, that's a very fair question. And I appreciate you asking. Um, I got that. <clears throat> I got that one recently and it was, it was a good curveball question, but um, out in the field, but you know, thankfully, it's 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 pretty it's pretty cut and spelled out as far as um, milk and milk product and and proper uh, destruction of of every particle in every particle of that of that product to be uh, taking out micro uh, pathogenic microorganisms. So thank you for asking. We also have another question about UVC for sanitizing vegetables. So uh, for our guest that is asking that question, if you would mind, uh, please email me, myself, Patricia, or Paul, and we will try to help you get some answers to those questions. Um, but for today, we're gonna kind of keep it towards milk. So again, email us those questions. We're happy to help you find some answers. Um, we do have some other questions, uh, Patricia, about using raw milk in a pie that you make or for icing. Um, so again, can you use milk in icing and can that milk or in a pie and can that be raw milk? So I'm going to, again, give two answers. I'm going to always say best practice is not to use raw milk in foods for the public. That being said, if you're making something at home under the Tennessee Food Freedom Act, there, there's nothing I can do to stop you. That's, that's kind of the black and white. If you're producing it under a manufacturing license, say you have an outbuilding and you're crazy busy and you really want to ramp up production and you don't want to put the warning statement that comes with Tennessee Food Freedom Act items on your product, um, and you wanted to go with a manufacturing license, we would not allow you to use raw milk in that product. But under Tennessee Food Freedom Act, as long as you're following all of the rules, then I, we, don't have a, we don't have the ability to say you can or can't. 
Thank you. The next question is, um, do we have a herd share template that uh, would be recommended or is there any personnel from TDA that could look over a herd share requirement guideline and see if it meets the requirements? Well, <clears throat> great question. And because we are so hands off, um, if you will, with, with the herd share, um, I don't have a template now. It's something that I can talk with or we can talk with as a team. Um, and it kind of couples into that. In, it, do we have recommendations for legal counsel who know what they're talking about question? Um, we Again, that's something we would do with our legal team to see how, how they would like us to address that is certainly how we give guidance like these presentations and when we're out in the field and and at these farmers markets um, to make sure that people, um, you know, there's there's no misunderstandings um, and that we are very consistent in what we're telling you guys and, and certainly building the trust that what we say is what are the guidelines and, and regulations that you, um, you know, you, you follow suit and, and you trust that it is um, it is what it is. So I don't Trish, I don't know if you know if any necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what I was going to say as far as again those written agreements those items to fit into the niche keyhole exceptions tda is not going to have guidance documents for that um, i saw that megan lafew was on here because she asked a question um, she may have some advice about what CFP, um, or not CFP, I'm sorry, I have all these acronyms floating in my head. The Center for Profitable Agriculture, if they have some help in that capacity, I that would be my best guess is to point you towards extension and point you towards UT Food Science to see if they have something that can assist you. Thank you. That's great. That was that was great. Thank you, uh, Trish, for saying that. And and certainly, I don't I don't see any other questions. But please, everybody, um, you have our contact information on here. Um, if there's something else I can help you uh, answer, and and certainly as far as guidance tools, um, shoot me an email, and I'll, I'll do the best I can to get you what you need. You know, certainly for success and to to keep your business, you know, going as um as really as profitable as you can. Uh, you know, you guys give us a job and and you trust us to, you know, to help you guys out as well. And so we want to make sure we keep you safe and wholesome with your products. Thank you both. And thank you to Kathy as well. If you have any questions, like Paul mentioned, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of them directly. And I will include their contact information in the follow-up email to everyone that is registered. If you have any questions again uh, for Kathy, feel free to put those in the question um, Q&A box now or the chat box now. Um, oh, we just have a new question. Do we have any information on the Center for Profitable Agriculture? Yes, I am a specialist with the Center for Profitable Agriculture. Um, again, Megan Lafew is also here on the call as well. Um, and she is also a marketing specialist with the Center. And we also have on the call with us uh, James Harlan and Elena Boyd. They are both um, some of our new employees with the Center for Profitable Agriculture, and we are all here to help answer your questions. Um, again, the Center for Profitable Agriculture is a unit of UT Extension. So again, you might be familiar with your local Extension agent in your county office, and they can help you get in touch with us as well and answer some of your questions on site. But we are also here um, serving statewide to help answer your questions as well. So again, the Center for Profitable Agriculture with UT Extension and you can find more information at cpa.tennessee.edu. And Megan has also put some um, information here in the Q&A box for everyone. Uh, we do have a fact sheet available on um, herd share requirements, different things like that. Um, and again, herd share agreements and things like that are really um, a great area for both UT Extension and the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. But again, we're happy to help walk you through any of those questions you might have individually about your operation. So again, feel free to reach out to us here at the Center for Prop WAG or uh, Patricia or Paul with any of those questions and Kathy Rubin also with TDA about the Produce Safety Program. Uh, Megan said that that fact sheet is about food safety risk associated with raw milk. 
So again, uh, please check that resource out and I will include that in our follow-up email as well so that you have access to that. And again, all of these sessions are recorded and posted on the Center for Profitable Agriculture YouTube channel so that you can review them if you want to go back and re-listen and um, find more resources as well and other videos on that YouTube channel. There are no other questions. We will go ahead and end this session. Um, thank you again for joining us for the second session of the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp. Again, uh, please complete the follow-up evaluation so that you can get credit for attending this session for the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, Tennessee Agriculture Enhancement Program, Application B. And again, if you have any questions about how to apply for that or what that is, please let us know. We are here to help. Okay, so thank you for joining. We will hang on here for a few more minutes and answer any follow-up questions that you might have. Yeah, Megan, thank you for sharing the, those resources. We appreciate it. We had a question about the link to the survey. It will be in the follow-up email. So again, if you are registered for these classes and you did not, um, you got that email directly from me, Rachel Painter, then you will have an email soon with the survey to take as well. So again, those uh, that link to that survey is tiny.utk.edu slash fmvendor. But again, I will send that to everyone in the follow-up email. And Paul, if you would uh, please send me your slides, I'll send those out as a PDF in the follow up email too. I will do that. Thank you. We have a question from Bernice Money. Uh, Bernice, I'm going to allow you to speak here, ask you to unmute. Hi, I'm sorry I was late, but as far as being a vendor at a at a event, will I need insurance? Insurance to be a vendor? Yes. At a farmer's market? Uh -huh. um, so most markets are definitely going to require that. I would suggest that you have insurance either way um, to protect yourself, but uh, most are going to require a you know certain level or coverage. Um, so that's dependent upon each market. But again, I would recommend definitely having insurance to cover yourself. So what sort of source of insurance? Um, I can send you some links to more information about that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank yes. you. And do you know the crops that are profitable to take to the market? Again, that is really going to depend upon um, your area, your market. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, schedule a follow-up time to speak with you about your operation and where you're at in the state and the skills and resources you have available and, and help you make a plan. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Bernice, is your email um, or is your name 
here on Zoom what you registered with so that I can find your email address? Yes, Dover Glenn. Okay. Sounds great. I will send you an email. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sorry for being late. You're fine. Okay, everyone. Um, so that concludes our session, of course, again today. So if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to any of us and I will send a follow-up email when this recording is posted so that you can review it if you have any questions. And again, we will include some links to where you can find more resources, the slides from today, the recording and the evaluation survey link, um, including, I know I see a question here in the Q&A, the produce safety rule. So we will send you some resources about what we discussed today.